Got a bunch of owner door of questions here at mailbag at wrestlingobserver.com. Uh, this person wants to know, is it true that Orndorff was held out of WrestleMania 3 to fill in if Andre couldn't do the main event? I mean, there's there's something to that, but, I mean, it like, at the time, you, Andre was going to do the main event, uh, you know, as long as he could walk, and Andre was in rough, rough, rough shape by then. But, yes, if for some reason, um, you know, he couldn't, I mean, Orndorff would have been the guy, he was a logical guy, but... I mean, it really wasn't going to happen. I mean, you know, um, that would be like a last ditch thing, you know, if a complete disaster happened. But Andre was the guy in that match. This person says, Can you talk about the big event show in Toronto? Was that the catalyst for deciding that WrestleMania 3 could draw big enough to fill a dome? Um, that's an interesting question. I'm sure that it was a huge part of it. Um, because that's August of 96, and WrestleMania is, I think, what, end of March of 97. So they, I'm thinking it was like the end of 96, just a couple months later, when they made the call. It might have been January. I think it was before January. I think it was like December, um, when they made the call for the Pontiac Silverdome. So I would say the fact... I would say it's a big part of it because one of the reasons they picked Detroit was they did like this. They wanted to do a stadium show because Hulk Hogan and Orndorff proved that they could draw that many people under the right circumstances if they had a hot enough match. And the feeling was Hogan and Andre was was a hotter match, which it was because, you know, Andre had been undefeated and Andre, you know, Andre was the the big, big star that everybody knew. And Orndorff was just the heel of the month. He was just the best heel of the month, so to speak. That, they, that he ever had. Um, I would say, you know, like, the biggest guy, I think, when it came to how shows drawing against Hogan was Savage, but I think Orndorff's peak was bigger. I would have to look that up, but they would be the two biggest. But the peak of Hogan-Orndorff was, because it was the biggest house show run that I ever recall in pro wrestling history would have been 1980 Bruno and Zabisco. And I remember Hogan and, and Orndorff beat that because they went everywhere. I mean, Bruno and Zabisco was only the Northeast. Hogan and Orndorff went everywhere and, and sold out almost everywhere, did, did great everywhere, especially first time, but in some places, multiple times. So, but, and of course the Toronto was broke, broke every record in the book. That was the, you know, they broke the Bruno Zabisco house show record. Um, and, um, so what happened was at that point, Vince says, we're going to go somewhere. We're going to go to a stadium and Detroit was picked. Number one, the Silverdome was really, it was bigger than most. And, and you could brag about indoor attendance record and all that. The other one is, is that they just kind of looked like Hogan and John Studd had drawn a really big fair crowd. You know, it was like 50,000 people, but it was, it's at a fair. Which is different. Okay, so 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 um, Hogan and Orndorff was at a fair, but it was like separate admission. Um, Hogan and Stud was like a grandstand show at the fair, and they had like fifty thousand people for that. And then they had like you know sixty thousand, sixty four thousand paid like real, you know, paying real money, real ticket prices for Hogan and Orndorff. So you got Columbus and you got um, um, Toronto, and then they thought about like you know these other cities that are all within a one-day drive of Detroit. So Detroit was picked for its proximity to all these different cities, Toronto being the key one. So, um, yes, that had um, that definitely had something to do with not only the idea that Hogan could draw for a WrestleMania against Andre, you know, a lot more than 20,000 people, uh, but also the the idea of where it was being Detroit was because of its proximity to Toronto. They didn't want to do Toronto. I think that there was the fear of being doing stuff outside the United States at that point. Although Toronto did get the Hogan Warrior WrestleMania, and that was it was funny because after the Hogan Warrior WrestleMania, which was a success at Sky Dome, I remember afterwards people telling me it's like there were all kinds of problems 
of doing the show in 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 Toronto and at that point it was like we'll never go back even though the, they made tons of money and it was actually the record gate at the time that that we're never going to go back to Toronto for a WrestleMania for a, or we're never going to do a pay-per-view in Canada which you know years later they rescinded but at the time there were so many problems with that so one of the things was is they wanted in the United States and Detroit was also you know a great place for the whole province of Ontario which was wrestling mad at the time so yeah so that's the story yes it absolutely would have had something to do with both the, the location and the fact that they went for a big stadium. This person wants to know, where does Orndorff's run with Hogan measure in terms of gate amongst Hogan's top WWE programs? Well, I pretty much answered that. Um, at its peak, it was the biggest house show program in um, the house show program in the history of wrestling as far as United States and anywhere. I don't think that there was ever that type of a program overseas. Um you know, I mean, Mexico had great programs and everything like that. But again, you wouldn't have had the number of cities and everything like that in Mexico drawing that type of those type of numbers. So it would be the biggest house show program in history. And, um, you know, like as far as the number of big gates drawn with Hogan, I think he's second to uh, Randy because Randy had multiple runs with Hogan and, and everything. But but he never had the the peak of. Um, Hogan and uh, Orndorff was the biggest peak house show run in the history of wrestling. And also, he says, WWE, uh, WWF was selling a large 24 by 36 Paul Orndorff poster during his heel run, which seemed odd to have merch for a top heel at the time. Was that a nod to his charisma, his physique? They probably printed up when he was a baby face and had to unload him, I'm guessing, because they didn't really merchandise heels like that. Um but yeah, I mean, you know, they, he, he had the great he had the great physique. I mean, clean or not clean, he had a great phys- he he always had he always had the great physique. You know, he trained hard. He looked like a guy who just trained super hard and um, probably watched what he ate. And um, you know, he was very into the physique part of it though, because um, I mean, even even in his forties and fifties, he still trained as hard as he could, even with a weak arm. You know, in the street fight, you know, someone's going to bring up you know the Vader story and. Um, well, that's next. What was the real story about the fight between Orndorff and oh, Vader? Oh, man, I don't remember. I mean, like, if you look at The Observer, I just remember that I, the, what, what I wrote in The Observer was pretty much it because I talked to several people who were there and several who were there watching it. I don't remember all the details. I mean, Leon Leon hated that story because Leon, and I talked to Leon about it, I mean, in detail, like a couple of days after. And, you know, Leon's version was as he was held and Orndorff punched him. And the punch wasn't that hard, but he did go down. He wanted to go after him and Ming was there and you don't go, you know what I mean? And he just, did, you know, so that's Leon's story. You know, Leon didn't like the idea he got knocked out by the bad hand and said it wasn't that hard of a punch and all that. Um, but he was knocked down and Orndorff was, I remember Orndorff was kicking him with the, with his, he didn't have any shoes on. He had flip flops. Yeah, flip flops, yeah. Yeah, and he was kicking him in the face when he knocked him down. It was, it was really, you know, um, I mean, Orndorff came off in the story like this big hero and everything, but I mean, this is like um, Orndorff was like in management at the time. He was like an agent, and Leon was like top heel wrestler, and I mean, Leon could be miserable and cranky and everything, and he was always hurt because he took so many bumps as at at, at his size, so he was always hurting. And 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 a prima donna and, and and things like that, you know. But he was, you know, I mean, let's, you know, Leon's one of the greatest big men workers of all time. So, as I recall, it was something along the lines of, you know, they were doing TV, and Orndorff is just like Leon, you know, you got to get ready, you got to do an interview, and Leon's just sitting there, and he's not getting up to do his interview, and Orndorff just loses his cool, and they start yelling and screaming, and then you know, they go at it, and. uh you know, Orndorff does deck him and kick him in the face. It's like freaking management. Like, Orndorff started the fight. I mean, like, in every version, Orndorff started the fight. Leon was a baby about, like, you know, he should have gotten up and done the interview. He shouldn't have mouthed off. But it's like, you know, and back then, like, you know, Orndorff, Orndorff wasn't punished because they everyone thought it was so cool. And guys, you know, in the business then, guys could fight each other, and it was just part of the business. Like, now, you know, if, if like, one of the agents, like... um who would be equivalent to who's who's the who's the top heel now? Um, Roman Reigns, well, he's the top everything. Yeah, yeah. If like um, whoever, when one of the agents like got mad, Roman's in a bad mood and just 
goes in there and starts yelling and screaming at him and it ends up in a fight, that agent's gone. I mean, he's so gone. But back then, I mean, I, and I thought Orndorff would be gone, but it was just kind of like, ah, uh, you know, guys will be guys. And everybody just thought it was the coolest thing. You know, Orndorff with the one arm, you know, with the bad arm knocked out Vader. And, you know, and a lot of people kind of thought Vader had it coming because, you know, he could be a complainer and everything. But yeah, yeah, I mean, that was a, a famous story. But man, Leon. Boy, did Leon hate that story, and every time that story would get told, he would just just go off on, oh, Orndorff, like, wants to claim that. I was held, you know, I was, two guys were holding me, and he punched me in the face, and whatever. So, it happened, and, and um, yeah. This person says, in celebrating Paul Orndorff's life and career, I was hoping Dave could go into further details and information around what I believe was one of Orndorff's best matches. Falls count to anywhere match with Cactus Jack from Super Brawl 3. I think Dave gave it four stars. It feels overlooked when compared to the rest of Foley's body of work with more daring bumps. It's a hellacious brawl. Looking for any insight on what Foley might have told Dave about it afterwards and where it stands in respect to Orndorff's top career matches. You know what's funny is I cannot recall ever talking to Foley about that match. You know, I mean, the you know, there's a lot of matches I have talked to him about. You know, the Shawn Michaels match, I think, is the one that I think he probably figures is one of his best matches. And the Vader matches, um, Sting matches, you know, those all come to mind. But I don't really recall ever talking to him. It is overlooked. Yeah, I remember that was a, a, a hell of a match. You know, another thing, too, it, when, um, what's the stuff? Then um, they did a deal in Georgia, and I'm... Um, where Larry Zabisco bought the belt. But I think they had like Killer Brooks beating Orndorff. This was when Orndorff was probably on his way out. Because I remember like, you guys are going to have Killer Brooks beat Paul Orndorff. Paul Orndorff was, was so great. I, didn't never, I never wanted that guy to leave the territory. He was so cool. You know, I mean, and um, and such a great wrestler. And he had those matches with Buzz Sawyer, who was at that time a great worker, too. And um, and then, you know, when he lost the championship, it's like, oh, God, he's going to, you know. And they, they did the thing where Larry Zabisco bought the belt and everything, which was silly. And then Orndorff, I think Orndorff may have beaten uh, Super Destroyer at some point for the title, maybe in a tournament or something, Scott Irwin. But um I remember when Orndorff was right at the end of the run where he started losing matches. It was like, oh, man, he's leaving the territory. And then he just disappeared um, and didn't really work much for, like, months. Like, I guess, whatever it was. It was This is when Vince was, like, stocking everything, you know, ready for that big expansion. And Orndorff was one of his key guys. And Orndorff, you know, I guess that they didn't bring him in right away. I guess that um, they didn't want to bring him in too early, which, if you think about it, if he'd come in right away, he would, as a heel... He would have to work with Backlund, and that was before Hogan got there. And then it would be like, oh, well, Hogan's wrestling some guy that Backlund already worked with. So it was like from a business standpoint, I don't know if they paid him to st sit at home, which would have been very rare in those days. I mean, they did send him to Japan a couple of times, so that might have been part of it. But, um, yeah, it, it made sense to not have Orndorff do any losses until... Hogan came in and then he could be Hogan's big rival because it was tough at the at the beginning because Hogan's such a big guy and you wanted heels that were believable against him. And, you know, Orndorff was probably 5'11", um, maybe. Um, I mean, he had a great physique, but he did have an intensity. And obviously the fact that he drew so well with Hogan, you know, after turning on him, but the fact he drew so well tells you that people did buy him against, I mean, obviously they bought him against Hogan because you wouldn't draw those numbers if they didn't. So, I mean, that speaks volumes of his ability for, for people to buy him as a tough guy, which, of course, he really was. All right, a couple more here. This person says, if you were booking WWF during Hogan's run, would you have had Orndorff beat Hogan for the title, even if only for a few months? My friends and I were debating whether having or uh, Orndorff win, particularly during the Saturday night's main event cage match where they tied, mm -hmm. would have been a good move just to keep things fresh. No. Hogan was drawing too well, and the, one of the keys to Hogan was that nobody beat him. And you don't want to, you don't, you didn't need to beat him. Business was too good. Um, you know, I mean, by the time. You know, when Hogan finally lost, I mean, he lost to Andre, but that was done as a fluke. And he was also taking time off to do a movie or else he would not have lost that that match, you know, or the, the or lost the championship. So um, and it was Andre. So that was like, OK. And then the next loss was Warrior. 
And then again, he was taking time off to do a movie. And also, at that point, Vince thought, well, you know, Hogan's getting too old and, and you know, we got to go with the young guy. You know, Norndorf was not that in that in that situation. I mean, it's it's like um, you can look back by today's standards and you throw the belt around and everything. But in those days, um, you had your champion and you you if he didn't draw, you know, if Hogan was not drawing and you felt that you needed to to um, spice it up and have him lose and then come back and go for the belt. Yes, Orndorff would have been Orndorff and Randy Savage would have been the two best guys, maybe Roddy Piper that were around in that era to do that. But uh, that never happened. I mean, and there was just no point in taking the title off of Hogan then. So, no, I would not. What Vince did then, I mean, I mean, the business speaks for itself. Um, it, it was not a pass-around belt. I mean, if, if or, you know, Orndorff, in a sense, like I said, like Orndorff could have been an NWA champion. In fact, when, when I saw him in Georgia, I was thinking that, you know, God, if it wasn't for the fact, you know, but I, again, I never thought that Orndorff would win the NWA title because Ric Flair was a better wrestler and Ric Flair was more charismatic and a much better talker and made a better world champion. If, if, if not for Ric Flair, Orndorff could have been that guy. Um, he, um, he, I don't remember ever, like, like, I remember lots of discussions of DiBiase in that spot. Um, I don't remember discussions of Orndorff in that spot. I think that they thought that DiBiase was the better, I, I don't know. I don't know what it was, but, but when Orndorff really, like, got to that point, you had Ric Flair and, and, you know, I, I don't think that Orndorff would have ever got the NWA title because Rick was Rick and they didn't, uh, you know, I mean, I don't know why they went back to, well, I know why they went back to Harley, but, you know, for the most part, the whole 80s was Ric Flair's era and they didn't bounce that title around. And the same thing with, with WWF with Hogan. It was just, that was the Hogan era. If, you know, if, if business had gotten bad at any point where, you know, that, 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 that Hogan needed a jolt. Yeah. Absolutely. That's in the back of your, it's in your back pocket. That's something you could have done, but it didn't happen. And I never remember like in that, in the whole Orndorff run, at no point did I ever think, oh man, they need to uh, change the title and get it to Orndorff. I did think with Savage, um, going to some shows and everything, um, you know, at that, at that WrestleMania where Hogan went back, I actually thought that, you know, that you could delay that one for a year because Hogan at that point, at that point, Hogan was so established that he didn't need the belt to draw, as as was shown with his um, with some of his when when Randy was champion and Hogan came back and Hogan was drawn great without the belt, and Randy was drawn great with the belt. So I thought, why consolidate it? Why make one? Because Randy wouldn't draw as good without the belt, and Hogan would still draw great without the belt. So, but they went right back to Hogan because that was the formula. But with Randy, I would have I would have gone with um. A title change or 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 not so not the title change but a fluke or something for randy to hold it for a year before hogan got it back whereas with orndorff there was never a time where i was thinking about that and especially with andre it's like you know why why have paul orndorff beat hogan before andre because you don't want you don't want you want hogan undefeated and you want andre undefeated going into that big match so anyway that's the answer hey if you're a big fan of wrestling observer radio we got 12,000 episodes of all of our podcasts up at our website, WrestlingObserver.com. If you sign up today, you get access to every single one of them. The 12 to 18 new shows that we do every single week. You can podcast them, listen to them on the road, at work, working out, in the shower, wherever you listen to your podcasts. And also full access to the Wrestling Observer newsletter and archives. So if you love what you hear, head to WrestlingObserver.com. 12,000 Audio shows at your fingertips.